Those of us that are curious about the fields of forensics and fans of shows like CSI have the benefit of hearing from someone with real life experience this afternoon as Chief Forensic Investigator Tom Vandenberg takes us behind the scenes of the work of the Greene County Medical Examiner's Office. A Q&A will follow his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Tom Vandenberg. Medical Examiner's Office. I have been with the Medical Examiner's Office since 97 um, when we moved here. And since I'm up here this far, I'm going to slip that off. Um, we moved here in late 97. I've been with the medical examiner's office ever since. Before we moved to Missouri, I was with a medical examiner's office up in Iowa, um, which was in a smaller town, a smaller county. So um, a lot different, a lot more call volume here. And it seems like it keeps getting busier. Um, I put this on here just so you know, at a picture of the building with my name for the uh, preliminary on, but this is the kind of people that we deal with. Um, people who today had plans for today, today have plans for this thing and doesn't quite work out. So we end up being involved. Um, we are located on North Campbell, north of Chestnut. We have a uh, facility, I believe it's 7,400 square feet. Um, we moved into that in 2014, and our doctor now, um, since the last time I presented in 2018 or 2019, um, we have hired a full-time doctor. Um, his name is Dr. Dieter Duff. He came from University of Missouri in Columbia, and uh, he is a younger pathologist who will long outlast me in the office. Um, I'm hoping to have another maybe three or four years and uh, be able to retire. He is much younger, so long time after. Um, we have an administrative assistant. When you call the office or to the door, Teresa's gonna meet at the front desk. Uh, she answers the phone, she sends out all our reports all the requests that we get she relays phone calls and messages to everybody um, it's really tough last week she was on vacation for the whole week and it really makes it a tough week because we have to try to pick up all the phone calls and answer the door and all of the things that your normal reception person does in amongst going to scenes doing autopsies and everything else that we have going on um, there are two full-time investigators, myself, and one other full-time investigator. We work Monday through Friday at 4.30 in the office, and then we cover about half of the night and weekend call. Um, Apologies, I'm sorry. We're going to ask you to switch out mics. Okay. And hopefully it wasn't just where I had it. But, no, uh, we, this one gave us trouble the other day and we thought we had it. Out. Okay, and how does it sound now? Nope, that is okay. Um, as I pulled the clip off of it. So we'll see if it works all right in a pocket. Um, all right. So myself and one other investigator are full-time. We have four part-time investigators. All our part-time investigators have other full-time jobs. So their availability is somewhat limited. Um, and most of them work as paramedics and EMTs, which with the pandemic, they have been having to work a lot of overtime with their full-time job. So that's lessened how much they can work for us. Um, so we are actually in the process of trying to hire a couple more part-time employees. Um, we're trying to convince the commissioners that we really probably need another full-time employee. Um, my wife can attest to uh, how often get woke up during the night 
how often don't get home until six or seven or eight at night, have to leave early in the morning. Um, Green County's population, I just looked at the 2020 numbers, which with the pandemic, I don't know how accurate that is, um, but uh, just under 300,000, 298,915 is what the Census Bureau says for Springfield and then, or for Green County. Um, and Springfield is the majority of Green County. We have a mixed system in Missouri. Um, there are coroners and there are medical examiners. The class one counties that when they became class one opted to have a medical examiner um, have that system. And all the rest of the counties are coroner systems. Basically Springfield, Columbia, St. Louis and Kansas City areas have medical examiners. Um, the rest of the state pretty much is a coroner system. The difference between the two coroners and elected official, basically you're 21 years old, you live in that county for six months, you're eligible to uh, run for coroner. Um, there's a really basic one day training session, how to fill out the forms when you become coroner. Um, after that, there's a yearly coroner meeting, which didn't happen for the pandemic. They uh, tried to have one live since then and not maybe half of the coroners were able to attend. Um, just it threw off everything um, for training and uh, everything. A medical examiner has to be a licensed physician. They are hired, basically appointed and hired by the county commission and they work at the pleasure of the county commission, which forensic pathologists are hard to find. So they would have to do something pretty egregious to be able to uh, be dismissed from that position, I think. Um, it took us several years to get a full-time forensic pathologist. We've had a few in the past and one circumstance or another, they either passed away or decided to move closer to family. But uh, our doctor now has family in the area. He's from Missouri and he looks to stay for the long haul. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, medical examiners just have to be a licensed physician. They don't have to be a forensic pathologist. Um, I know Jefferson City and a couple other counties actually have a medical examiner who is appointed by the commission, but they are not a pathologist. So they still have to then send their autopsies to a forensic pathologist to have their autopsies done. Who knows who this is? Every time there are less people, um, Dr. Quincy was the medical examiner coroner for the LA County office uh, on television back in the 70s, 80s. And that's where a lot of people first really saw anything about forensic pathology and how he solved all the mysteries. And he would hop in the station wagon with Sam and they'd go off and investigate scenes. And that doesn't usually happen. Our doctor hardly ever goes out to the scene. He's too busy in the office or with all the other responsibilities he has. Um, that's why we have investigators to do that. Um, our office is outlined by statute. Um, 57.720 is the medical examiner statute. And basically it just says if you die in a county um, as a result of any violence, be that homicide, suicide, accident, um, any burns, criminal abortions, contagious diseases, or really just anybody that dies suddenly and unexpectedly, um, in any kind of questionable circumstance, if they haven't been to a doctor in 36 hours or if they're in custody. And custody does not necessarily mean they are actually in jail. Um, long ago, there was a coroner in another county when we were doing the autopsies for all the outlying counties. And he called one day and he said, well, I have a question on a technical thing. I don't think this guy is in custody because they only had the handcuff on one wrist. I said, Ron, 
that's in custody. <laughs> it doesn't matter any time somebody is interacting with law enforcement, whether they have been officially arrested or not, we consider that in custody. But there are always questions that come up and said some coroners he was new and that's not in the training. You get elected and you're expected to know all these fine points. And so we are always available to consult with uh, anybody that has questions about that. The essential functions of our office, we do death investigation. That's the primary thing um, of all those things outlined in statute. We do autopsies if they're required. We only do autopsies in less than 10% of cases. We'll do a full autopsy. Um, we complete death certificates. We do hundreds of death certificates. Missouri law has not been updated in a long time. And there are a lot of other states that have updated statutes and physicians are required unless there is a circumstance that the medical examiner would need to sign, um, which would be anything other than a natural death. If it's a natural death, some states require their physicians to do that. Missouri just says the physician should do that. But if they don't, then the medical examiner or coroner is required to. So we get a ton of death certificates from doctors who will say, well, I wasn't there. I don't know why they died. He said, well, we don't either. And we're going to read your notes from six months ago to figure out what was wrong with them. But uh, Missouri law allows doctors to do that because they're not required to sign a death certificate. We are if they choose not to. Um, cremation authorization permits. A lot of times somebody is going to be cremated before the death certificate is completed because the death certificate can take sometimes weeks to get all the information to properly do that. So if somebody is going to be cremated, um, we will review the death. And uh, a lot of times that's just reviewing medical records. But we'll review that, and then we will sign a cremation permit, which allows them to go ahead with the cremation before the death certificate's completed. Um, we do a lot of those, although not as many as we used to. We had funeral homes who, as soon as a family would call, before they'd meet with them, before they knew anything, they would want us to sign a cremation permit just in case the family wanted to do cremation so they could tell them, we can do it immediately which we like to see that. And a lot of states have a law that requires 24 or 48 hours after death before cremation can take place. Missouri doesn't have that either. If they can find a doctor that'll sign, they can go immediately from the death to the crematory, um, as long as the doctor will sign that permit. Um, so there are things that I always, every time we get a new representative, I bug them because there's a lot of stuff that needs changed and updated. But uh, we told funeral homes and set a policy um, that if it's not a medical examiner case, but they just want a cremation authorization to expedite things, but another doctor is going to sign, then we would charge them $50. As soon as that policy went in place, our cremation authorizations dropped by a third. And I think we've charged that five times in the last six or seven years. Um, so we hardly ever actually charge that unless it's just the funeral home will call and say, we want to cremate this guy today. He died two days ago, but the doctor's not in to sign it until next week. We'll pay the $50. Okay. If you're volunteering to do that, we'll take it. But uh, we hardly ever do that. Um, we do a lot of depositions and trial testimony. Our doctor in the last two weeks has testified at four homicide trials. Um, COVID, that's another side effect of COVID. It used to average one trial a month. And for us, it's either a wrongful death or a homicide when we're going to testify. Um, sometimes motor vehicle accidents or other accidents will have to do a deposition or testify. Um, didn't do any in 2020 because there weren't any courts in session. So they saved them all up. And the one homicide trial that the doctor testified at the preliminary hearing last week was from 2018. 
And that's their preliminary hearing to decide whether they need to set the trial date. So it's crazy how everything has been thrown off in the last few years. And we do consultations. We do consultations with attorneys. We do consultations with law enforcement. And we do consultations with families. If families just really want something explained, we'll have them come in. We'll sit down and go over everything with them. Um, a lot of times when the autopsy report's issued, families will have questions about that. So we'll have them come in and just go over the report with them. And sometimes it's by phone, but a lot of times it's easier to have them come in, sit down just around the conference table, and then they can get the answers that they're looking for. We also started doing our own transportation a year ago. Um, prior to that, we had a couple funeral homes that rotated to do our transportation. We're to $100 for each of that. Um, since we got our own van, and our van is designed, it's got two levels. We can carry four bodies in there. Um, we've only done that a far since we've had it, but uh, many times, two often and, um, and times one incident but there's been many times we've gone from one to the next before we make it back to the office um, so it really helped out and really expedited things there were a lot of times we would call the funeral home to transport and then we'd wait an hour and a half or sometimes longer for them to show up and when we have multiple things going on, we can just get there, load up the body, transport back to the office. Of course, when someone is decomposing or when they're bloody or, and they're 350 pounds on the third floor, we say, man, I wish the old days were back when we could just call somebody to do this. But uh, we, all support each other and the police are good with helping us and sometimes we'll have to call the fire department um, we've had a couple of people that you know are 500 plus pounds at home and there's just no way to safely do that so we'll call the fire department and they're real good about coming us too but uh, we have saved in transportation costs we went from the year before we got the van spending $28,000 in transportation to so far this year, we've spent less than a thousand. So we are using it as a money saving thing and really a time saving thing for us. It is designed with COVID in mind. It's completely isolated front to back. It's got uh, UV filtration in the back. It's got extra filtration when we have decomposed bodies or anybody in the back. So. Um, it's really much nicer. We have another really old vehicle the county gave us before we got the van that you can only fit somebody in if they're less than six feet and less than 200 pounds because the back is small and the cot sits against my shoulder when I drive because it's just, but before that we had nothing. We used our own vehicles and had, had to have the funeral homes do the transportation. Um, Child deaths are a special category in Missouri. It's the only autopsy required under Missouri law is between one week and one year if there is no pre-diagnosed condition that the child's expected to die. So if a child leaves the hospital not expected to die, then an autopsy is required um, between one week and one year. And I have only a couple times over the years had families really try to say we could not do that. Um, and you just explain the law to them. We don't have an option. We have to do this. And we try to just work with them to explain everything as best we can. Did have one of the funnier stories that I have, though, was a baby death. And it was from another county when we were doing the other county autopsies. And suspicious circumstances this needs investigated we have to do an autopsy and i'm sitting at my desk and three guys in trench coats sunglasses and one of them has a briefcase come through the door 
And he reaches in the briefcase and he slams down about three inches worth of papers and says, this is a cease and desist order. You will not do an autopsy on this baby. And just thank you. And they stood there for a minute and then just turned around and all walked back out. And we did the autopsy and everything worked out fine. But they're just trying to bluff, thinking if they looked like that, because in the movies, that's who's going to come in and order this. And Okay. <laughs> But uh, life is not like the movies. I was testifying at a murder trial and uh, the defense was asking some kind of off the wall stuff and the prosecution's redirect. All he said was, so what you're saying is what you do isn't like on TV. I said, correct. And that was that was the end of it. <sighs> There's a child fatality review panel in every county. Um, Children who die in a care setting in the hospital or have a diagnosis already are not going to get reviewed by the child fatality review panel. We still have to fill out an online form. It's like 20 pages and uh, still make a report on every child death. But the panel reviews anything where there are any suspicious circumstances, any accidents, um, you know, any baby between a week and a year that uh, an autopsy is done, those still get reviewed. And then the state of Missouri has a technical assistance team. Their purpose is to assist with child death investigation anywhere in the state. They have a couple investigators and smaller counties, smaller jurisdictions, their investigators will come out. They have a lot more resources to help them with child death and they're specific to child death investigation. Um, we had a death a long time ago where the police jurisdiction did not want them to come in. So we said, okay, well, we want you to come to the autopsy and observe the autopsy. So their investigator came down to the autopsy, talked to the detective and said, you know, we should check this out. We should check this out. And after the autopsy, the detective was like, you're right. And they went back and we ended up getting a confession and conviction out of that for the death, which would have been hard to do without their detective coming down. Um, so they really do provide some great services. And they also oversee our paperwork, make sure we get the paperwork in and get it in on time. And um, so it's a good resource for child deaths, but child deaths get a little more investigation um, than adults sometimes, but just because it's required to uh, go through all the extra steps. This is our autopsy room, and it looks small in this. It's compressed, but uh, before we opened our facility in 2014, we did our autopsies at Cox South, and uh, the morgue at Cox South has one table. It's, well, 35 years old now, but uh, when we were doing our autopsies there, it was showing its age. The hydraulics didn't always work twice, during the autopsy, you'd have to lift the end of the table up so the water would keep draining. Um, there was a private company that started in 2003. They also did their autopsies there and the hospital autopsies were done there. Sometimes we'd have to wait two days just to get into the autopsy room to do our cases. Um, our facility is freestanding. We have, it's divided into two sections, the office section, we each have our own office space, a conference room, a break room, storage rooms, a file room, and then our receptionist has her own area. Um, and then in the back, there's only two openings from the front half of the building to the back because unfortunately there are some unpleasant smells. There are some loud noises um, when we're using a saw back there. So we've got a series of doorways to control that sound so you don't walk in the front door and hear what's going on in the back. Um, it really has worked out well for us. There is where that other table is over in the corner. Um, there is plumbing and ventilation in that wall. So if we ever get to the point where we need another autopsy station in there, that's already designed in. Um, it would just be a matter of getting the autopsy station, placing it there, and uh, 
hooking it up, which you never know what's going to happen in the future. Before 2003, we did the autopsies for 34 counties in Southwest Missouri. Right now we are busy enough that we do Green County. We're other counties will ask us if we can do their cases. We're just not at that point yet because of our staffing and how many cases we do that uh, we can do that for other counties. But uh, it's very high tech and yet some of the stuff really isn't. We still have the uh, pickle bucket that we use um, just for temporary container during the autopsy. It's the right size, it works, it's easy to clean. Um, we have a titanium block to support under the back during the autopsy, but it like leaves indentations and it's hard to work with and it scratches the table. So the four by four wood block works better. And most every morgue I've ever been to is a wood block and they have commercial stainless steel rib cutters that cost couple hundred dollars, but uh, $6 at uh, Ace Hardware, they work so much better and they're easier. You have more leverage. Um, sometimes ribs can be kind of tough. And depending on who's doing the autopsy, we have some smaller stature people helping. It's uh, much easier to use something like that in every morgue I've been to around the country. That's what they use. They don't use the little hospital rib cutters. This is our main cooler. This is just like a quarter of our main cooler. That racking system will hold 20 bodies. Um, and then there's room for another probably 40 bodies in there. There's room for another set of those racks. So that'd be 40 and then room for a lot more carts. Um, so we were designed after the Joplin tornado. And we wanted to have enough space if something major happens again in Southwest Missouri that we don't need to bring in refrigerated semi trucks. And then what do you do with them afterwards? Although now with the pandemic, there are a lot of companies advertising. They bought refrigerated semi trucks, retrofitted them as coolers, and they'll lease to facilities that need them. So it's not like before those companies weren't around, you had to get one from a trucking company. And then when you're done with it, it's yours, because what do you do with it afterwards? Um, so now that's become a new business is uh, refrigerated trailers. Um, 2018 was when I had statistics when I was here last. For the total year of 2018, there were a total of 4,184 cases reported to our office. 2020, because everything was crazy in 2020, there were only 4,066 cases reported to us. Um, we did 129 autopsies in 2018. We were contracting with a private pathologist at that point, and he only did our full autopsies that really we had no choice in doing. Since then, in 2020, we had a full-time forensic pathologist in-house. We do more autopsies because the doctor is there. That's what he's there for. So we went from 129 to 331 in that two-year period because we had a doctor. Scene investigations were about the same. Um, nursing home deaths actually dropped a little in 2020 because people weren't going to the nursing home if they absolutely didn't have to. People were staying at their home. Um, hospice deaths actually dropped too because people weren't getting signed up and weren't getting services from hospice. Um, we did a lot more cremations because the people that were dying, a lot more people were cremated because you weren't having funerals. Um, so a lot more people were just being cremated. Um, and then Missouri law in 2008 changed. It used to be if somebody was admitted to the hospital and died here, no matter what the cause was, we investigated the death. In 2008, that changed to where if an incident happens in another county in Missouri, 
and it's an accident, it's a homicide, it's suicide. We can't investigate that. We just have to call the coroner from that county where they came from and say, hey, this is your case. And they decide whether they're going to have an autopsy or if they just want to let it go. Um, so those cases are all people who were brought here from an incident in another county die here. Now, if they are in an incident in Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, we get a lot of those that are brought here. Those are ours because the death certificate doesn't go back across state lines, but it crosses all the county lines it wants to um, and has to go back to the other county. So far this year, we're catching up. Um, we've already had 4,405 cases reported to us. Um, we have autopsy 336 was brought in this morning. Um, 365 death scene investigations. That's before um, the four from last night and today so far. Um, 479 nursing home deaths so far, 803 hospice deaths. We've already done 639 cremation authorizations and referred 120 roughly back to other counties. So things are certainly picking back up. Um, we're getting a lot busier. And we notice that because it seems like we're doing so many more calls today. Back when I started in 97, you would be on call from Friday night until Monday morning, and you might get six calls if it was busy. Now it probably averages in that time period, 25 to 30. Um, an average night, we're getting between six and 10 calls on an average night now. Used to be one or two. Um, it's just really gotten a lot busier for us. Part of that is the hospitals are required to notify us if it's an accident, if it's anything other than a natural death. They can never figure that out. So one hospital several years ago started calling us on every death. Last year, the other hospital said, you know, we give up too. So now both hospitals report every death to us, which when they weren't doing that, you know, they try, but everybody interprets things differently. And we would get on average a couple cases a week that somebody died in the hospital, we weren't notified. And then two weeks later, we'll get a death certificate assigned because, well, they were an accident or they were a suicide and say, never heard of them. And then you're two weeks behind going back and backtracking, get the information. So Missouri death certificates have cause or manners of death. Um, a lot of people get cause and manner confused. Um, manner is natural death. Um, cause would be the specific problem. Accident is a manner. Suicide is the manner. Homicide is a manner of death. And occasionally we will do undetermined. Um, we have a couple cases that uh, we have done undetermined just because there was a case where by the time law enforcement and the ambulance people got there, the family had already moved some things around. And then the ambulance people moved more things around. And so by the time law enforcement and I got out there, I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I can't tell. And we, there were some things that made us suspicious, but it may be just because something got moved and nobody remembered where it was initially. So since everything was scattered around, we're saying, you know, we're just not comfortable with saying this is obviously this or this. So occasionally there is an undetermined. Um, child deaths, especially infants, the National Association of Medical Examiners puts out guidelines for cause and manner of death. And uh, they've redone in the last few years the child infant death. And so a lot more of those now in the old days, they would have just been called SIDS. If you don't have an obvious cause and manner, you called it SIDS and it was natural. And well, that doesn't happen anymore. So now there are a lot more that are undetermined, undetermined with 
extrinsic or intrinsic factors. And it just really is kind of confusing to people, but uh, we just say we can't say for sure, but this is what we saw. And, um, you know, a lot of times sharing a bed with an adult or another child, um, that's an extrinsic factor or intrinsic factors. They had a fever, but we don't know why they had a fever. Um, so there's some undetermined, but uh, natural deaths, which is a majority of deaths, we look at people's medical history. That's the most important thing because the best predictor of future is the past. And so if somebody's got a history of heart disease and suddenly collapses, probably their heart. Um, we look at age, but age is kind of secondary because we have people who are young that have a lot of medical history. Um, but we also can't bring in every person that dies unexpectedly. So our cutoff age for bringing somebody in for an autopsy if they don't have a lot of pre-diagnosed history is 60, but we'll also look at all, all the other factors. If somebody's 65 and the family just really wants to know and has a valid reason why they want us to do an autopsy, we'll try to work with them and uh, usually we'll go ahead and do it. But if somebody's 46, but has a lot of medical problems and has a story that goes along with their history, we probably won't do an autopsy. Um, the circumstances of the death really make a big difference. If everything looks natural, there's no sign of any kind of foul play, um, and they have some history, really lessens the chances of doing an autopsy. Um, we will also look at all their medications. Sometimes people don't know what medical problems somebody has, but we'll say, well, what medicines are you on? And uh, we'll look at the medicines and that'll give us a pretty good idea of what they've been treated for. COVID was, and still is, um, every time we think it's gone, all of a sudden we get a bunch again. Um, I think we've had five or six in the last few days again, but uh, the hospitals will close down their COVID units or mostly. They still will have a few, but uh, 2020, we had 621 COVID deaths reported to us. And uh, in 2021, we had 787 so far. Um, like I said, we've had several again in the last week. Um, we initially were testing a lot of people. The first person we had that we suspected might be COVID, the family suspected was COVID, and the health department said, well, we don't test dead people. And so we weren't able to get it tested. We actually had to finally send it out to a private lab because the family was threatening to call the president and make us do it. And uh, so we found a private lab to do the testing. And right after that, then the health department said, no, we will test people if you think that they have symptoms. And we have found a lot of COVID. And what was really amazing to me, we didn't know how long after death you could pick up COVID and nobody knew that. And we had a couple people who were in a state of decomposition had been dead for over a week and came back still active COVID um, when we would swab. And uh, so there was and is, we're in a trough again, which is great because it seemed like all we were doing some days was COVID cases. Uh, I think the most I had one day was six or seven. Um, one of our guys had a day where he had 10 COVID deaths and most of them were from the hospital, but uh, you would talk to the nurses at the hospital and they were just so disheartened because there's nothing to do. Just try to, take care of them the best you could. Um, accidental deaths, motor vehicle collisions, falls, overdoses, burns, weather related and drowning. Um, last year we had, I think six hypothermia and hyperthermia deaths um, in Springfield. A lot of those are your homeless people, but uh, we just actually had a couple 
last week that I think with that cold snap and a couple of the freezing temperature nights, um, you know, you go out on somebody and they're mostly undressed and it's 30 degrees. Um, you have a condition where in hypothermia, your body thinks you're hot. And so people take off their clothes. And we had somebody last year who it was one of those nights, it was zero. And when he was found had on one sock and everything else was scattered for about a block up to where he was. And so it's paradoxical undressing and that's a really big sign, but uh, it seems like we've got so many people that don't have good heated shelter on a regular basis. And uh, so we get a lot of weather related people. Just the numbers really kind of fluctuate a little, but uh, pretty stable for accidents. Um, Springfield right now, this year, I think we'll probably set a record again. Last year, they set a record for fatalities in the city. And we're on track to do that again, because it just seems like it's constant. Um, suicides, in 2018, we had 96. We really look at the scene. We go to every suspected suicide death. We really look at the scene. Um, we try to see if there's anything to show intention. Um, we look for notes. We look at phones. We look at email. We look at Facebook. Um, and we work with law enforcement for a lot of that. Um, but if we have the time, we'll actually look at all that ourselves. And we're always looking at the scene for notes and looking at phones if they're unlocked. And uh, a lot of people that have fingerprint will actually scan their fingers so we can open their phone um, at the scene so that we can look for that. And evidence of planning or research, computer search logs. And we still get a couple people a year that have the old paperback or the hardcover final exit book. And uh, we've had people that go online, you can actually order the entire suicide kit with the book and the helium tanks. And um, we've come up with you know, some people that have come up with other things. Um, we had somebody that actually ordered instead of the helium tanks, carbon dioxide tanks. Um, and we had a suicide that had run a hose in the window of the car. And that's pretty common. Run a hose from the exhaust into the car, tape it all up. And his carbon monoxide level was minimal, normal for just anybody that's around a smoker. Because new cars are so efficient, they're not putting out carbon monoxide. So carbon dioxide displaces the oxygen. And so his carbon monoxide level was low. He wasn't cherry pink like we see in carbon monoxide, but you don't test for carbon dioxide, but he's in a closed environment with a hose from the exhaust into the car, everything's sealed. And so carbon dioxide can kill just as well as carbon monoxide. Um, so it just, Technology changes things, but uh, we just look at everything to decide. And just lots of boring numbers and stuff, and I'm just talking. So every once in a while, I find something. I thought that was kind of funny. And it's amazing how many people we find with lottery tickets. And we don't go check the numbers, but uh, we'll put it back with their stuff. Say, you know, you never know. Could be the winner. But that happens quite a bit. Um, suicide numbers, 2018, we had a peak at 96. So far this year, we've had 54. Um, we've had a couple this week again, but uh, it's still a big problem. You know, that's more than one a week, sometimes two a week. Um, and it seems like it should be more. We had three last weekend again. It just it seems to us day to day like it should be more, but then the overall numbers at the end of the year, we have those slow weeks where we don't have one. So it kind of balances those out. Um, homicide is death at the hands of another. That does not mean that it's murder. Um, 
there are justifiable homicides where the prosecutor chooses not to file charges, calls it self-defense, uh, the castle doctrine. Um, some prosecutors are big on castle doctrine, say, no, this person came onto their property and was causing them to be in fear, so they're not going to charge them. But we, so our homicide number is always higher than the police's homicide number. But uh, if they don't have murder charges, they don't count it as a homicide, but we do. Um, so ours are always a little higher than theirs. But we look at every death as a possible homicide until it's proven otherwise. Um, back in the day, back when I got here in 97, we'd have five homicides a year, six homicides a year was normal. Um, 10 was just craziness. And 2018, we had 30. So far this year, we've had 30. Um, and it just, we still got almost a month and a half to go. And around the holidays, we always get some. So um, <laughs> we are hoping that it doesn't go any higher, but uh, been around this long enough to know that it most likely will um, before the end of the year. The sergeant in the Springfield PD homicide unit is retiring. So we were at a scene the other day and he said, this is my last one. And said, we'll see. But uh, I think he's the fifth homicide sergeant that's retired since I've been in full time. Um, they come and go. Very few people at Springfield PD now have worked there before I was here. So <laughs> that's a sign I've been here too long, I think. Um, undetermined, we talked about that kind of already. Just doesn't give us clear. Um, cause of death, like I said, is different. And uh, cause of death is the specific cause, like arteriosclerotic or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. You build up plaque in your arteries. Um, that We can see that at autopsy. We'll cut sections. We try to get grant funding for whatever we can. We got a macro photography stand. So now we get beautiful pictures of blocked coronary arteries and uh, things like that, that we had trouble with before, but, uh, and then blunt force injuries from motor vehicle collision. Uh, we try to keep some of that stuff pretty basic on the death certificate because 50 years from now, when somebody's looking through, um, we want it to be consistent and easy for people to figure out, um, not use new terminology or something that 50 years from now, people are going to say, what's that mean? Um, archives several years ago put together a soft cover book of just old causes of death from death certificates back in the 1800s. They're very interesting. There's a lot of railroad accidents and dynamite suicides and strychnine suicides and things like that, that we just don't see anymore, which is fine. Um, we look at scene investigation as a big part of figuring out what happened. For people that we're taking calls on, we're evaluating their medical history, seeing if it matches what they were complaining of. Um, examination of the body, if there's any question, We'll bring the body in, we'll review medical records, we'll also look at the body, make sure there's no injuries. Sometimes bruises won't show up for 24 hours, um, so it's better to look at them the next day and make sure there's no bruises that showed up. Toxicology testing, we are using NMS, which is National Medical Services, I believe, in Pennsylvania. They are the premier toxicology lab in the country. Um, we were using a local lab in the state and they had some issues and their equipment got old and it got to where we were waiting three to four months for toxicology results. And when we switched to NMS, it went down to four weeks or less. Well, with COVID, that's gone up to eight to 10 weeks, but they're trying to hire more people. And you know, we've talked to them and every medical examiner coroner office I know uses NMS now because they are the best lab, but everybody's got the same situation. Nobody's getting it any quicker. 
And then autopsy is the last result or the last resort for doing a full autopsy if you don't have a cause from all the others. Autopsy numbers have fluctuated. 2018, 2019 was when we had that contract pathologist who would only do. And so all of the suicides, accidents, everything that our pathologist actually looks at and writes a report now, we were having to do that. The investigators were having to do all those and do the toxicology testing because the pathologist would only come in and do a full autopsy. So we're down 106 in 2019. Um, and so far this year, 336. Um, National Association of Medical Examiner, Examiners says a single pathologist shouldn't do more than 250 full autopsies, but then anywhere from three to five external exams, and this number includes our externals. Um, right now, about 25% of the autopsies we're just doing external in toxicology. So we're coming close to that number for name. And we want to try not to go over because we are trying to uh, get accredited by the National Association. Um, offices can be accredited. You have to meet like 120 criteria and they have inspectors that come out and check that you meet all the criteria. So we are trying to do that. We hope to within the next one to two years get accredited. Um, Overdoses are always a big issue. Um, we average around 100 to a little over 100. So far this year, 123, and we've had four since I left the office yesterday. So it just keeps going up. And it's just one of those things, it's getting worse. This is gonna be our highest total this year forever. Um, fentanyl is one of our biggest things. Way back when I was doing my bachelor's degree, I did a paper on oxycodone because that was the big thing. The oxycodone started the whole um, opioid epidemic and that was killing more people than anything else we see. Heroin came around a little bit. Traditionally, we had very few heroin deaths. The first 10 years I worked in Springfield, I think we had two heroin deaths. You just didn't see it. And Spring or uh, St. Louis, Kansas City, lots of heroin, lots of cocaine. Um, Springfield, not so much. Five years ago, six years ago, we had a lot of heroin. And we were seeing quite a bit. Fentanyl has almost completely done away with heroin. We had a couple of years again with one or two heroin deaths, but fentanyl has replaced it. And back in the day, Fentanyl was somebody's duragesic patch because the patches are supposed to be put on for three days. You slowly absorb it, but we'd go out and we'd see the patches and they'd have, they'd scrape the gel off, put it on foil, melt it down. Um, some people do really inventive things, cutting down soda cans like you see on Pinterest to make little stoves. They were doing that to melt fentanyl off the patches and making chambers to inhale it with and everything. Really got inventive, but, uh, and then that's pretty much gone. I don't remember the last time I've seen a duragesic patch. We just don't see them anymore. And then you're getting a lot of stuff on the street and people are just cutting the fingers off of gloves, tying it up or using little balloons, tying it up. And you know, that was from a few years ago. Don't see that very often anymore. But uh, now it's all business. Um, you know, fentanyl is a white or an off-white powder. Uh, this person had a lot more than you would think for personal use um, and the little scale to measure it out. So, you know, it's big, big business and it's big business here in Springfield. Um, Methamphetamine is the other one. And... Um, I redid a slide that had actual methamphetamine, but uh, I forgot to load it on my tablet to put it on here. It's on my desktop at the office, but it's a white or off-white, but it's more crystalline. It's chunky. It's little crystals. It looks kind of like really coarse salt or sugar, um, but it usually comes in these little plastic bags. 
Uh, this person had, at that time, the highest methamphetamine level we'd seen. Um, it was 25,000 nanograms. The typical overdoses we're seeing are 400 to 1,200 nanograms. And he had 25,000. Well, we come to find out they were looking at his phone and he had texted somebody the day before that he had got pulled over by the police and he swallowed the bag of methamphetamine and over 24 hours, the bag finally ruptured and he got the whole bag at once. Um, since that time, I had a guy at a motel who, when he was on meth, so he's acting crazy. So when they called the police and the police banged on the door, he took a sandwich bag of it and he had like 50 something thousand nanograms and just ate a sandwich bag of meth, which people didn't think methamphetamine could kill you, but it really does. Um, common drug abuse methods, people snort stuff. This is classic for cocaine, but I've seen acetyl fentanyl, I've seen fentanyl, I've seen methamphetamine, anything, and you just put it on a shiny surface, scrape it into a line, and when we find short straws and a shiny surface, Somebody's been snorting, whatever, anything you can grind up, you can snort. Um, a lot of people will put it on foil and we look for foil with burn marks because they put it on there with a little water, melt it down and you can inject it. You can drink it. You can inhale the vapors as it melts. And we still see a ton of syringes um, and syringes are everywhere. We went to France a few years ago and in 10 days in France, I did not see a syringe. Got home, stopped at Walmart, got out of the car. There's a syringe laying in the parking lot. Walk up to the door. There's a syringe laying by the door. Walk the dogs the next morning. There's a syringe laying along the sidewalk. It's like, we're back. But uh, IV drug abuse is really a big thing. Um, we look for not only the syringe, but a source of water, there's almost always a cap or a cup or something with some water. Usually it's a spoon and something for a filter. Whenever I see somebody that cuts a filter off a cigarette, that's almost always what it's used for, is they'll use it as a filter to draw up through. Because we have had people who actually got chunks of the drug in their vein and caused a reaction and when it wasn't, uh, it was big enough to get in there, but uh, or small enough to get in there, but too big, and it clumped up. Identification, I've got a couple examples of identification. We fingerprint everybody that comes through the office, and we also um, take a DNA sample. 15, 10 years ago, maybe, they did these cards, and it's a little paper card, and you put two drops of blood on it, and then you let it dry 24 hours, you tape it shut and put it in a little envelope. It'll stay in the file for at least 15 to 20 years. And uh, fingerprints, law enforcement now has a digital scanner that will go to the scene and say, hey, can you get your scanner? Because we want to see if this really is who we think it is. Because we don't have access to the law enforcement database. So we can't use the scanner ourselves. But uh, most of the time when they come out and somebody's dead, they'll say, yeah, here, and just <laughs> hand you the scanner. So we'll scan the fingerprints and they'll plug it in. And 15 seconds later, we know who it is if they're in the database. But it's been several years ago. I got called to the train yard over off of uh, just north of Commercial Street. And there's an arm. And it's just, and it's an arm from just above the elbow, just laying there in the middle of the train yard. And they said, well, we've checked with the hospitals and nobody has somebody that came in missing an arm. And I said, well, it's not fresh. You could see that it had been frozen. The end was kind of yellowish orange and it was dried and I said, this looks like it's been frozen. So I said, well, what do we do with it? I said, well, I'll take it along and put it in a little bag and took it back and went over to the Highway Patrol Crime Lab and called first and the guy that was there loved doing fingerprints for us 
And he was always, if you get something really nasty, call me and I'll bring one of the new people out. And he loved it. So brought this arm in and we spent a half hour and we got fingerprints off the arm. And on TV, you know that if you get a fingerprint, all you do is put it in the computer and it shows you who belongs to and where they're at and what they're doing. And But it really doesn't work that way. He ran it through the FBI database. He ran it through the military, all these, nothing. And so he came here from Texas. So if he couldn't find anything in any of the national databases, his first default was to run it through Texas because he knew somebody's still down there. So he sent it to Texas and they said, yeah, he was arrested here. And I think it was San Antonio about 10 years ago. So here's his name. And, but we don't have anything since then. And so we looked everywhere here locally, nobody had ever heard of this guy. And so we did the big secret forensic thing and Googled his name and he had committed suicide in Northern Montana by stepping in front of a train three and a half months before it cut his arm off and his arm was stuck under the train. It was frozen under there going back and forth across the high line in Montana to Washington and back for like three and a half months got here. It was spring. It thawed and dropped off in the train yard. <laughs> and so called the coroner up in Montana and said, Hey, your guy that stepped in front of the train, was he missing his right arm? And he said, yeah. <laughs> said, you want it? <laughs> he said, well, can you cremate it? And so we cremated it and sent it back to him by UPS or FedEx. And everybody was happy. The big mystery was solved, but yeah, stuff like that. Um, we get a lot of skeletal remains, not a ton, but several times a year, we'll, somebody will find skeletonized remains. And so we had one not too long ago, and our doctor did his training in St. Louis at St. Louis City Medical Examiner's Office, and he worked with a forensic anthropologist who has a PhD and is trained to identify bones and all the stuff. And so we had the skeleton come in and when I went to the scene, there's a skeleton wrapped in a sleeping bag and there's a syringe and a meth pipe right up by their head. I said, so I think this is an overdose. And there was enough tissue goo that we sent to the lab that they found a really high level of methamphetamine. And so we knew it was an overdose but we wanted to confirm who it was. So we brought him in and we did an x-ray and there's a big hole in the back of the skull. And so the first thing you think of is, oh man, somebody whacked him with a hammer. So we look at the back of the skull and said, no, that's all well healed. And so looked at missing persons and found who we thought it might be, looked at their medical record. And when they were in their teens, they had a tumor and they made a hole in the back of the skull to go in and get the tumor. And then they had been in an accident and had a couple ribs broken. And when we looked at those ribs, there's big calluses on the ribs where they healed it said, okay, we are pretty sure we have this, but we had the forensic anthropologist come down just to clean everything else off and to clean everything else off. You can't just scrub it with a brush. So she said, well, I'll come because she moved to Michigan, but she said, I'm going to come back to Missouri. So all I need is several crock pots. And so our doctor went to Salvation Army or Goodwill or somewhere, bought like every crock pot they had. And so we had for a week, we had all these crock pots sitting out on the table in the autopsy room and the police had come for an autopsy and go, are you guys having a buffet back here? Yeah, you want to come? But uh, so now we have a whole two drawers of a file cabinet full of crock pots. So in the future, we don't need to go to the Goodwill again. We have all the crock pots there. Um, so we're all set for that. Exciting thing, more grant funding. When we designed our facility, we designed a separate room to do decomposed and the more smelly autopsies. And we got a grant for a cooler specifically for those. So we have another cooler that can hold 
30 bodies. And it goes directly from the garage into that cooler into this blank storeroom of concrete block. Well, yesterday they painted the inside of the room and that's the new autopsy station. So hopefully in about a month at the most, we'll be able to do those there and not have to go into the main autopsy suite and trail through three rooms to get there. And we'll be able to just keep it all in that little area. So sometimes I'm happy that my tax dollars are at work to give me a grant to be able to finally finish this seven years after we moved in or six years after we moved in but we're finally getting to finish this space so we can do. And then if we have a disaster, we'll have more capacity because that would give us four autopsy stations if we needed it. Um, and then we also have this trailer, which can hold 27 bodies in refrigeration. Um, part of the COVID plan for the hospitals here was if they needed the extra capacity because their coolers were full, they could use the trailer, plug it into a shoreline and use it as a separate cooler. Or if their cooler has a mechanical issue and fails, you can just bring the trailer over to them. They can use it. Um, if there's a mass casualty incident, we'll have that to be able to respond anywhere. Only used it one time so far since we've had it. And that was when the duck boat sank. We uh, took it down there and uh, brought those back. But uh, it is there. It's a regional resource. It's for anybody that needs it. And I have talked far too long. So now it's your turn. Yes. Well, I have one comment mm -hmm. from uh, the webinar. She says, I'm never going to think of crock pots in the same way. So <laughs> I, I feel the same as her. It's like, it's going to be very strange to look at that. Also a question, and it goes back to the drug usage yes. and, and the different ways that people take drugs. Yes. She says um, she's got carpet burns on the, uh, in, her, in her rental mm -hmm. um, from drug usage. And yeah. she's concerned that that's a health hazard, especially for her children. Is, is there a, is it something she should be worried about? You know, back when there was a lot of people producing methamphetamines, you'd get meth labs and it really could get into the carpet. It could get into the wallboard. Um, we very seldom see that anymore. Um, but there are so many things that we do that uh, we're not able to clean up. And so... I know on our brochure and on our website, um, there is a link to a list of cleaning companies who specialize in cleaning up hazardous. So I would really suggest you contact. Um, I know Service Masters, um, Serve Pro, Bixler here locally. And then there are several other um, franchises that uh, have offices around the state that they can come out and give her a lot better idea of just what that might be. But uh, yeah, you know, certainly it could be from drug use and there are still some people cooking that, uh, you know, that can get into the fabric of carpet or soak into the wallboard. Um, we also have a lot of death scenes that are really messy that homeowners shouldn't have to try to clean up. And uh, so we always suggest contacting one of those cleaning companies who can uh, give them advice or come out and do that. And most homeowner insurances will help cover that. Yes. Well, if we are doing an autopsy, it doesn't. The question um, was, what does an autopsy cost? It's your tax dollars at work. Um, we get less than $2 per person for the Green County. So if we're doing an autopsy for somebody's family, they're getting their $2 worth out of that year um, for their property taxes. But uh, we do not charge for autopsies. Now, if there is a death that the family really wants an autopsy done, but the person died in care or there's an obvious cause of death that there wouldn't be a reason for us to do it as a forensic autopsy. There's a private company in Ozark that does those. I believe their cost is somewhere $35 to $3,700.
But uh, yeah, I had a family member ask that this morning. She's like, how much is this going to cost? And will Medicare pay for it? And I said, it doesn't cost because we're a county office. That's the service we provide. So our autopsies do not cost anything. We'll ask you were first here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and there would be no question in that because. Okay. Um, the question was, there's been some controversy um, about cause of death and whether COVID would be listed if somebody had a motorcycle accident. No, it would not because if they have an obvious cause of death, um, for us to put COVID on a death certificate, they have to have active signs and symptoms with respiratory failure that is due to COVID. We've done a lot of autopsies on COVID people and their lungs are just shot. They don't work anymore, but we have to see that to put COVID on a death certificate. I know there was talk about how anybody that uh, had a diagnosis of COVID, whether they you know, got shot or in a car accident, it would just be put on there for money. No, we don't have anything to do with that. Yes. One of our listeners is asking, is there a, a possibility to volunteer with your department to see if that is a career path they'd like to pursue? Well, we get requests all the time for people to come and shadow us. Um, that is a possibility. You have to be 18 to actually go back and see the back part of the building where autopsies are going on or to uh, you know be exposed to any of that but uh, and we've had even junior high students come in and just sit down and talk to them for an hour or two explain everything and then you know we have a lot of people who are interested that they may think that is a career path and uh, certainly we encourage them to contact the office and uh, you know we will at very least have them come in and discuss everything and uh, show them what we do. We've had a couple of applicants the last time we posted our part-time position that uh, came in and really thought it was something they were interested in. And when they came to an autopsy, they never came back and are answered calls anymore. So some people are exposed to it and decide, you know, really, no, I'm not going to do this. And can coroners do autopsy? Um, coroners are an elected official. They, unless they are a pathologist, they cannot do an autopsy. They have to arrange for a licensed pathologist to do the autopsy. What was the difference from a pathologist and a medical examiner? Well, a medical examiner in Missouri just has to be a licensed physician. Um, the pathologist to have an autopsy done, you have to have a licensed pathologist. Pathologists are a medical doctor who then go on to additional training, and it's about three years additional training and a fellowship to be certified as a pathologist. And uh, a forensic pathologist, they get their initial pathology training and then go another year to year and a half for forensic pathology. So... There's a lot of investment in training and forensic pathologists typically work for government and that automatically knocks their salary down at least a third from what they can make in private business. So the last 10 to 15 years, they've only been able to fill half of the training spots for forensic pathologists just because, and we were watching a TV show and uh, it was about a forensic pathologist and there was a new employee that came in and said, well, I've always kind of thought of forensic pathology as like the cul-de-sac you end up in, in your career. And it's like for old guys that don't want to do all the hospital work anymore. But uh, there are people that really, that's what they want to do. And it is a lot of you're involved in all the homicides, all the accidents, and it's interesting stuff. And people really have to want to do it, though, because they can make a lot more 
with less training to uh, be a hospital pathologist or private pathologist in a uh, pathology lab that does samples for clinics and things like that. But uh, people are in forensic pathology because they want to be. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we can. Um, yeah, and you just never know. Every day is different. You know, yesterday I woke up at 4.30 to go to a scene and got home at 7. And then somebody else, I was supposed to be on call last night, but one of the other part-time guys said, hey, I'm not going deer hunting in the morning. I'll cover tonight, which worked out well because he went to a overdose and then had, I think he said, seven other hospital calls during the night. So I was on this morning. I went to one scene, sent another part-time guy who is covering for me now, said, hey, can you go to this other scene? And then took three other calls. And so I go back on at six and till Monday night. So we'll see. <laughs> you just never know. Some nights you do get to sleep and sometimes you don't get to hardly at all. So you just sleep when you can. <laughs> yes. Overdoses on younger and younger people. Are you seeing that? You know, every age. We've had kids as young as 12, I think. And we've had people in their 80s that, uh, yeah, it's amazing how many people. And I was participated in a uh, conference last week, and they were saying, you know, really the methamphetamine crowd a lot of them still keep doing it and we're seeing more people in their 60s and 70s that are still doing methamphetamine and it's just it's so addictive they just can't get out of it and they've made it to a, you know 60s and 70s but we'll routinely get people in their 60s that have methamphetamine in their system still <laughs> yes yeah. Can you tell the difference between what was the manner of death where the individual died versus what's decomposition? Uh, decom uh, decomposition. If, uh, the person was missing for six months, mm -hmm. and then the autopsy report says that their box, that their manner of death was inconclusive. Yeah. So we don't know how to read the autopsy report. Well, decomposition can really make it tough to get good answers. And that's the guy that we had that the forensic anthropologist came in um, just to make sure there were no hidden injuries because we'll get people anywhere from decomposition can be anywhere from they're starting to have some green patches to a skeleton. And, uh, you know, we've found skeletons in clothes and you look at the situation but there are no organs to look at. There's, you can't tell if they had a heart attack or a stroke because there just aren't organs anymore. Um, and as I so tactfully said on our skeleton, sometimes at that advanced state, all there is is kind of a brownish gray paste. And we sent some of that and they found methamphetamine in it. And we've had that on several skeletons. They can test that and uh, still find drugs, but uh, short of finding drugs, you can't tell anything from that. Um, you're basically looking for any injuries on the bones from knife wounds, gunshot wounds, fractures, um, things like that. But uh, yeah, you can't, when you get to that point of decomposition, you can't tell. Um, and then the manner of death, um, if you can't tell for sure what the cause is, it's hard to know what the manner is because somebody could have killed them, but they might have died a natural death or could have been hypothermia, hyperthermia. There are so many things. Um, and I saw on the brochure that uh, the funeral director that came in that has the books and the podcast, 
when I die, will my cat eat my eyeballs? And I would say no. But if you have a dog, all bets are off. I've seen far more dogs nibble and eat on people than cats. Cats get a bad rap. And we've got two dogs and three cats. And I'll trust the cats, but the dogs, all bets are off. Uh, so, you know, cats have that reputation, but I've seen far more dogs. So in answer to Caitlin's question, probably not, but if you have a dog, all bets are off. <laughs> okay. Well, is there anything else I can answer? Yes. Well, if they went home and if they go home healthy and they're three days old because you get out a lot quicker, that law was from back when you didn't get out for a week. Um, but yes, anytime they leave the hospital or wherever they were born healthy, not expected to die, it has to be investigated. But the law specifically says one week to one year. But that's just, there are so many things in Missouri law that have never been updated. And that's one of those. And we've had people and coroners say, well, but it says I don't have to do it if they're under a week. And you just give them the look and say, really? Especially under a week, you really wanna know. So, but yeah, the law specifically says a week to a year, but common sense says if they are not expected to die, it has to be investigated. <laughs> but yeah, there are so many things in Missouri law, although not enough that it'd make me wanna run for any political office. So <laughs> not one of the things I would wanna do in retirement. <laughs> All right, well, like I said, we are always available for consultation if you uh, have questions. Um, if you haven't grabbed a brochure, please. Thank you very much for your time, Tom. Everyone would join me in thanking Tom. Very good.